for um, for India. Now, there's a lot. Seems to be a lot of people away today. Yeah. It's a small group. We collected a thousand dollars. Wow. A thousand dollars. So that's a uh, timely when we're doing this sermon on generosity. Yeah. So um, yeah. give yourself a clap for that. That thousand dollars, so we can send two thousand dollars over to India, which would have exceeded our goal. Oh, that's so that's uh, going to be really encouraging well and good to group. So we've collected today, and we're getting money together to go and do uh, a good cause. And uh, the interesting thing about generosity <laughs> is that what well, we can be proud of our generosity today. It's possible for us, particularly in the Western world, where in Australia, we, we, we are you know, in the top 1% of, of uh, wealth in the world. It's easy for us to be seemingly generous with our money, but in fact be stingy in our hearts. We could be giving money for selfish reasons. So this topic of generosity is one which goes a lot deeper than giving money. And money in itself is a vehicle. Money is a currency. There's a book called now called The Five Languages of Love. Perhaps some of you have read that. Yeah. And um, the notion is that um, we have our own currency as to how we understand that love is being expressed to us. Money or currency is a vehicle, a medium for exchanging value. So we hand over a piece of paper or a coin and we get something in return because that is a, it's a means of that it represents something. But in our lives, we can be generous in so many more ways, as Miles talked about a bit in the, um, in the introduction this morning. Money is one way. We can be generous with our time and our thinking. We can be generous uh, with our work, our acts of service. We can be generous with um, our emotions with what we bring to church. You know, there are some days when we come to church and the church seems to be really happening, you know. You can feel it in the air. People are bringing their, they're being generous with their emotions. And there are other days when perhaps we come to church and it's seemingly a little flat, when we're not being so generous with our emotions. And we can be generous with, with our services we talked about. Um, our boys are involved in a soccer club. And um, the soccer club is Rottermere Football Club. There's a fellow there, when we first started going to that club, his name is Peter Basham. Now I'd say 90% of the, the Rotomir Club is Lebanese. And um, at the awards night last year, I got talking to a lot of the people that we bumped into. And there was a theme that started to really emerge. And so I talked to, to people at the grounds when we were there training as I was there on the night uh, for the awards night. And the theme that emerged that I started hearing is people you know, in their mid-40s, mid-30s, saying, we owe this club so much. Mm -hmm. And when you ask why, they say, because this club stopped us from getting involved in all sorts of stuff. You see, we were in between. My parents were Lebanese, they said. We didn't fit. We weren't Lebanese. We weren't Australian. And so people got into so many different things, bad things. If it wasn't for this club, if it wasn't for Peter Basham, then we, who knows what we would have been involved in. I googled Peter Basham. Mm -hmm. Now Peter is there at the club at 7 o'clock in the morning. His wife is there running the canteen at 7 o'clock in the morning. And they play right through to uh, Premier League 3, the adults. They often play, finished at 9.30 at night. Yvonne is still in the canteen, serving kebabs, or whatever it is, they live in these. Acts of service, generosity. And it struck me how much their generosity has impacted people's lives, how it's changed people's lives. And so generosity as a topic for us in the church is one uh, which is really important to us. Sometimes we can be faced in situations where we uh, give our money, but we're not necessarily willing to get involved. We don't want to spend the time doing it. Well, at that point, our money is of less value than our time. Or maybe we don't want to get involved, you know, oh, it's, I'm, I'm happy to give my money to the orphanage, but I don't want to go out and help them because it's just so confronting. Well, our emotions then are of greater value than our money. It's easier to give our money. 
So today we're going to look at three aspects. There are many aspects of generosity, but today I'd like to explore three. Generosity in our homes, generosity in our relationships, and generosity in our church. We're not going to go there now, but if we look in Romans 12, there is a heading in the NIV that says, Love in Action. And there is a number of things. And one of those things, it says plainly, one sentence, two words, practice hospitality. So, generosity in our homes is, to some degree, about hospitality. So let's explore what hospitality uh, is about. I'm going to get Tori to read uh, Luke chapter 14. Please turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 7. Now he told a parable to those who were invited, when he noticed how they chose the places of honour, saying to them, When you are invited by somebody to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the place of honour, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, Give your place to this person. And then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes to you, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will be honoured in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. He said also to the man who had invited them, When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbours, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor and the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Thank you, Tori. So, some context here. And um, we've got to take our minds back to the time that this was happening. If you think about it, uh, there weren't big global corporations, there wasn't government infrastructure to the extent that there was today, employing thousands of people. Communities were really run by small business people. And uh, sure, some people were able to grow businesses bigger than others, but that depended on how you did your business. Business in those days was largely done by networks. And so if you're a business owner, one of the things you would want to do is to try and work out who's who in the zoo. Who are the people that I could get to in this society, which is very hierarchical in those days? How can I get to somebody who has a lot of influence, who could get me in touch with that person over there, or who would buy lots of my uh, lots of my product, maybe greeting cards? Right. <laughs> so the context here is that if I was a business person, if I invited the right people to my house, it was common courtesy that they would invite me to their house. Have you ever thought that when somebody's invited you to dinner and a couple of mm. weeks later you think, oh, I really must get, you know, I really must get the bodies over for dinner. We went over there. And so it's kind of, this is not, it's kind of curse. It's curse. And so um, what they would do in these days in order to work their network is to say, if I invite that person, then they will invite me to their place and they know so and so, so then I can, now, Jesus' advice here is good advice because what he's saying is it was also common courtesy that the people who knew the host the best would sit closest to the host. And so Jesus is offering some advice here. Don't just assume, you know, where you're going to sit because it will be really embarrassing for them to say, oh, can you move down so Simon can sit here because that would be embarrassing. So display a little bit of humility. Sit further away, it's always better to be Good advice, Jesus. And so what Jesus, what Jesus is saying here in the context is, you know, to bring people into your home is a great thing, but why are you doing it? Why are you bringing people into your home? What's the purpose? Is there an ulterior motive? Or is it just to love and to, uh, and to, and to enjoy people's hospitality? Now, apparently, the Greek word in... Uh, in this text here for hospitality is a word philoxenia philoxenia philio, philo, love anyone know what xenia is? foreigners foreigners, strangers so 
when Jesus is talking about hospitality here, what he's saying is, don't bring those people that you know into your house. You can always do that. But are you bringing strangers <coughs> into your house? Are you welcoming people into your home and, uh, and using this as a way to just reach out and get to know people, to express your love? Are you being generous in your love? When I think back to our early days in the church, Sonia and I, even before we were Christians, we thought it was strange. We were blown away by the amount of meals that we had, coffees that we had going into people's homes. It was awesome. It's exciting to meet new people. It's exciting to be served in that way. And, you know, I, I think this is something that along the years, as the years have gone by, I'm not seeing as much of that in the church. Or well, maybe I'm just on the outer. And I'm not the <laughs> you know, there's ways that we can express hospitality. You know, we have our home groups that we do once a month, and various people have meetings in their house and uh, teens and so on. Uh, and that's that's great. That's great hospitality. Yet what we're also talking about there is, are we just giving of ourselves? You know, this is a this is a really interesting thing. This is about bringing people into your home. Hospitality is about letting people into your <laughs> living space, letting people into your life. Isn't that personal? When you're letting people into your life, it's about treating strangers as family. To be welcomed into somebody's home and treated as family. Why? You know, the thing that when I think back to our early days of being reached out and, and as, as early Christians, I can remember. <coughs> down the track, being friends with some very curious people, <laughs> people that I would never have expected to be friends. God is the true host. Mm. Yeah. And when we invite people into our homes, some of the strangest people, people you wouldn't normally connect with, God works to become your friends. Mm. And what happens with friendship? What happens with friendship? is we get respect, we get trust, we get love. And when there's trust, when there's respect, when there's love, people open their hearts. When they open their hearts, we can be real. We can invite them to things. Without the biases, without the filters that will prevent them from otherwise. And so that's why hospitality is such an important aspect. Now, also just in that verse that Tori read out, it says, don't invite your brothers. Now, the reason that Jesus is saying that is because they're going to invite you back. That was, that's what we do. But you see, when it says there, go out and invite the poor and, you know, the weak and the sick, that would never happen in that society. It would never happen in that society. They would never accept your invitation because they couldn't reciprocate. And so it's really about bringing those people into your home. It's not about reciprocity. It's about giving. That's about generosity. When I visited the uh, LA church several times over the last four months, I can't believe the hospitality the dinners that I was invited to, you know, more, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't take them. I couldn't go to this barbecue and go to that restaurant with those people. At, at one stage, I had to accept an invitation, and then in order for me to be able to give back, I had to word, you know, speak to the wait staff to say, I'm paying the bill, bring it to me. Because they wouldn't let me contribute. They were so generous in wanting to reach out to awesome hospitality. Um, there are people that open their homes to, uh, to, to people now and are making a difference. I, I, you know, one couple I know, Sam and Tori, opening their home every week Amen. and bringing people in in the campus group. There's visitors <laughs> coming along there who uh, they're just being friends with and being exposed to spiritual concepts and discussions. And it's going to open their hearts. And at some stage, there'll be a discussion which maybe leads to them studying the Bible and we pray that they become Christian because of it. So, hospitality. Come on.
the next one is about uh, generosity in our relationships. Now, um, is this related to hospitality? In some ways it is, because we do bring people that we have relationships into our church, into our homes, but maybe uh, there's some other aspects of generosity in our relationships here that we can explore. I'm going to get Sam um, in a moment to read Luke 17. Turn your Bibles there. While you're turning there, I want to give you an example of generosity in relationships. You know, there are some people who are more generous in relationships than others. Is it the way we're made? Is it sin? I, I don't know. It's just, it's just the way it is. For example, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's had a critical point in his life. He's about to go to the cross. Maybe the guys don't fully understand this yet. I, I, I don't know. He's gone to the Garden of Gethsemane and he says, can you stay awake and pray with me? Surely they can see the anguish on his face. Can you stay awake and pray with me? What do they do? Fall asleep. They fell asleep. They've had a big meal, had some great fellowship, a few glasses of wine, gone into a bit of a food and wine coma for a couple of hours while, while Jesus is at his hour of greatest need. What happens? What does Jesus say? Does he get them and go, guys, like, what are you doing? Seriously. I asked you to do one thing and you couldn't even do it. Is that what he did? What did he do? You remember what he said? Get up, guys. He said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He's cutting us some slack. This is an example of Jesus being generous in his relationships. Sometimes, if we, if we were as generous in our relationships with others as we are with ourselves, maybe our relationships may be a little bit different. You know what I mean? Some of us are blessed with that. Some of us are not. Some people are just naturally uh, looking for what's wrong, not appreciating what's happening, being critical, not using their empathy. That's not being generous in relationships. Being generous in relationships is, is at times cutting people some slack and knowing what it's about. There's another area of generosity. I'm going to get uh, Sam to read that. Luke 17, verse 3, now, 3 to 10. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day, and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. The apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. And the Lord said, If you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, Be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Will any one of you who has a servant ploughing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, Come at once and recline at the table? Will he not rather say to him, Prepare supper for me and dress properly, and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you have commanded, say, We are worthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. So forgiveness here is a form of generosity. And um, many of us here know that the that numbers in the Bible can mean some things. Many of us here know that, uh, that seven is a number that means completeness or wholeness. And so we can read this a couple of ways. We can say if somebody just keeps on sinning towards you, well, we should keep on forgiving. The other way we can read that is to say, well, if they sin completely, like really bad, then what do we need to do? What do we need to forgive? We, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I did a, a lesson on forgiveness. Think about this. Think about the greatest violation, the greatest violation that you've experienced in your life, or that you could imagine. What does Jesus say to you? He says, forgive. This is huge. What's, what's the response? The apostles say to the Lord, in verse 5, increase our faith. If you're having troubles with forgiveness, it's a faith issue. Increase our faith. How do we have faith? It's an understanding of our own relationship with God. So, um, the interesting thing in this is that also in verse 3 there, the, the very first verse that Sam read out, 
so watch yourselves. Why would Jesus say, so watch yourselves? If you're being violated, if somebody sinned against you, why watch yourself? Well, because when we're in unforgiveness, we tend to take a position of judgment and superiority. I'd never do what that person's done to me. Whoa, hang on a second. Watch yourself. Where's your part right now? And faith is about looking at Christ. Not yourself, but looking at Christ. Watch yourself because unforgiveness also leads to a whole host of other things like bitterness. To some degree, I think unforgiveness can almost be like being demon possessed. Now, what I mean by that is when a person is demon possessed, it's like they're enslaved, they're, jail, they're in a jail, they're captured by this demon, and it's controlling their thinking. When we're so bitter, when we're so unforgiving, and we're so bitter, it's like we're a slave to this, and we can't get, we can't free ourselves. As Jesus says, I'm stretching things a little bit here. When the apostles couldn't cast a demon out of a young boy, he said, sometimes these things can only come out by prayer. <coughs> now, different circumstance, but I think it's good advice. If we're struggling with unforgiveness, yeah. sometimes it just takes prayer and faith. Yeah. And I encourage you, if you are struggling with unforgiveness, if you're bitter, get with someone who you trust in the community of this church. Talk it through. Confess it. Ask for their prayers. Because it's only in that way that we can be free. It's only through forgiveness that we can be free. Uh, the last topic I want to have a look at is generosity in the church. Susan, can you read out Luke chapter 9? Please turn your Bibles to uh, Luke chapter 9. Now, as you do that, I'm just going to give some background here. This is where Jesus sends out the 72. So he's already sent the apostles out, or the, the disciples, the twelve disciples out. He sent them out to do some work. He sent them out to reach out to people, to heal people, and so on. And so uh, we can pick it up in 9.57 through 10 too, As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plough and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Thank you. So Jesus sent out the 72 here. And what, um, what I didn't know, I just learned as I was putting this lesson together, maybe um, some of you here did know this, is that uh, you know, we have terms in our society. And so if somebody talked about the 72, it was um, it said to be referring back to Genesis, the table of nations, which were, so the table of nations is all of the descendants of Noah that repopulated the earth after the flood. And so when they talk about Jesus sending out the 12, well, he sent out the disciples. When he sends out the 72, he's talking about sending out everyone. So that's us as well. To do what? Well, to go and, and reach out to people, to go and be generous in sharing uh, their lives with one another. It says here that Jesus sends them out. Jesus sends them out. We tend to be, just think about it, when we're not generous, we tend to be focused on in. Oh, I don't, I don't have the energy today to give to one another. Oh, you know, gee, the service is flat today. But, uh, like I'm encouraged today, what is up here singing? You know, we're, we're self focused. Generosity requires us being outward. So when Jesus sends out the 72, he's sending them out from themselves, out from their 
the things that are enslaving them, out from their fears, out from all of the things that are holding them back. The truth is, you know, when I think about myself here, when I don't have a spirit of generosity and I'm inward focused and I think about outreach, I don't want to. I don't want to have, I work so hard and we've got lots of kids and we're running around, but I don't want to have people into my home, I'm too tired. Where am I focused? When we focus on Christ, we focus out. When we're generous, we're focusing outwards. But I can't. Lord, help me with my faith. Because, you see, this generosity, this level of generosity we have is directly related to our relationship with Christ. And so when he's, when he, uh, in, the verse, in the verses there, uh, in verse 58, Lord, um, can I follow you? Foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Jesus is saying, have you really thought about this? I, I know you want to follow me. Do you know what it takes? Have you really thought about it? He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their, their own dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Oh, that's it. What's Jesus saying? Can the dead bury the dead? No, they can't. Jesus is saying, let the spiritually dead take care of that stuff. Does that mean that you don't go to your own father's funeral? Oh, let's be real. Do you think that's consistent with what Jesus is talking about? We read on. Still another said, I'll follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. I've got to remember, this is a patriarchal society here in these days. And I still see that now. In, in, you know, in, you think about the Arabic communities that are around, and, and, and not just Arabic, but other communities like that. We don't have that so much in this great culture. What my family would think of me in those days is everything. Family approval is everything. And so what this guy is actually saying is, uh, you know, let me make sure that my family approve of this and, and I'll follow you because I'm worried about the reputation that I might have. So the theme here is about what are we putting first? Where is our relationship with God here, with Jesus, that allows me to be generous? That allows me... And then in verse 61, 62, putting the hand in the plough. And again, we don't necessarily understand this. Uh, we're not in farming communities and we have big tractors that do ploughing here today. But uh, what Jesus is talking about, you think about those wooden ploughs. If you weren't watching where you were going, you into a rock, the plough's broken, your livelihood's gone. So it was really important when you're ploughing to look ahead. We make this commitment with Jesus. Our commitment needs to be to look ahead. And so we don't put our eyes backwards. We don't think back. We don't look at the things that maybe we're not doing. We look at what Jesus has done for us. Now, as I was putting this together, I was beginning to get overwhelmed, quite honestly. And um, I'm thinking, you know, I can't do this. This is so much to do. Lord, help me with my faith. In John 10, we're promised that a relationship with God gives us life to the full. Well, maybe I'm looking the wrong way here. Maybe I'm looking at this incorrectly. Because if God is promising life to the full, we know that God is love. We know that God loves us so much that he gave Jesus to us. He's one and only son. We know that Jesus gave up his deity to come to the earth to pay the price that was, that was that for us. We know that he gave his life. We know that he, was, he gave his connection to God on the cross. Lord, why have you forsaken me? He said. And even as they nailed, can you imagine that? Being spread out and then nailing. Could you imagine the pain? And he's saying, God, please forgive me. When we understand our relationship with God, and we understand His generosity, it's not about guilt. It's not about what we can't do. It's about what we can do in Christ.
Christ and the fact that we are free, that we can have life to the full, that we don't need to be burdened by all this, if we just submit. If we just say, well, Jesus is Lord of our life. Let's just submit to this and do it and do it wholeheartedly and bring the blessings. When we understand God's generosity, we can't help but be, be more generous ourselves. I urge you all in the coming weeks and, and uh, months, focus, focus on this. Focus on generosity. I'm inspired by this. Focus on generosity. Have a look through the Bible and understand the generosity that's been lavished on us from God. Um, in Australia, we have the material possessions. It's not about that. It's about Christ. It's about forgiveness. It's about the number of days we have on earth and Simon talked about before. What about what we've got coming? That's what it's about. I think for me there's a lot of lessons in this and, I, and uh, I'm excited about what we can be as a church if we can be more giving. We can take it to the next level. Be more giving to one another while we're here. Be more giving to people to bring them into the family. Just to become friends with them and see God will work it from there. Yeah. If we can just be generous to people, to be friends and to love them, then things can truly be fantastic. Amen. Father in heaven, thank you so much, God. You have just lavished us uh, with your generosity. All through the Bible, we see how uh, how you've been working, conspiring for thousands and thousands of years to bring Jesus to the, to the earth, so that we can be forgiven, Father. Lord, we thank you. None of us are deserving of it, but Father, you do bring us into your family. Father, we're we're there. Um, we we are we are in your family, and Father, it's. Uh, it's so easy for us to focus on ourselves and to focus on uh, uh, inwardly and to, uh, as a result of that, not be generous, Father. Help us to be generous. Help us to understand how you bless us and how free we are, Father. Help us not to be overwhelmed by the things of, uh, that you want us to do, Father, but just to submit and to trust God, to, uh, to focus on loving you, to focus on loving each other, and to focus on loving the people we don't know, to bring them into your family. Father, we thank you uh, for this message. We thank you everything you give us in Jesus' name. Amen.